Hello, everybody, and welcome to Around the Layout, where model railroaders come to tell their story. My name is Ray Arnott. So glad you could join us. Joining us from Sebastian, Florida, John Farrington. John, welcome to the show. Hey, Ray. Thanks for having me. Oh, great to have you here, John. We've been, uh, I've been following along and uh, obviously mutual friend of, of both of us now, Don Iris, and uh, the layout yep. work that you've been doing down there and uh, excited to hear about what you got uh, building in your home and um, hear, hear your story. So glad to, glad to have you here. Yeah, thank you. So let's uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, how you got into the hobby. It seems like the place to start right in the beginning. So, yeah. uh, what what got you uh, what got you involved in model railroading? Well, I would say the um, the passion of model railroading really started with my grandfather. Um, as a young kid, he was into trains, HO scale trains. Uh, he did get sick as I, when I was you know, relatively young. So he kind of got out of the hobby a bit. Um, as did I, I was really just kind of, uh, you know, I had the four by eight sheet. My father somehow built, he wasn't a model railroader, but he somehow managed to build me this four by eight, uh, you know, layout, classic layout. Um, and, uh, yeah, after, after my grandfather passed away, unfortunately just kind of you know, drifted away a little bit from the hobby, but never really lost interest. It was kind of just no one in my life was, was in the hobby. So it just kind of, you know, sat idle for a while, you know, uh, until I would say maybe about seven years ago, five, seven years ago, I, uh, you know, I would say thanks to YouTube, you know, finding people online modeling really kind of sparked my interest again. That's pretty amazing. Uh, so how long of a gap was it between say, you know, the, the four by eight layout and then your kind of return to the hobby? You know, I would have to say some, somewhere in, you know, I don't know, fifth grade, maybe I was like middle school when, when kind of he stopped, you know, he was building a layout in his basement, my grandfather. And yeah. what it was, was every year for Christmas, it was like, you know, I could just remember that feeling like it was yesterday of, being so excited because he was going to bring up, he had a, a layout that he made specifically for Christmas that would go under the tree. And, you know, Christmas Eve, we'd go to my grandparents' house and it was just so exciting to, to see what he brought up that year, what he did, what trains he brought up. And we would run trains all night. Um, but, you know, as he got sick, we, you know, he couldn't bring the layout up anymore. And then he stopped working on his layout downstairs and, you know, then he, then he, you know, passed away. Um, which is unfortunate. A lot of his stuff that he had got uh, destroyed in a flood a few years after he passed away. So I was, you know, it kind of sat in the basement in boxes and I didn't really want to bring it up, you know, but I really wanted that, you know, the trains and they just kind of sat there and I wish I got them earlier because the flood kind of took them all out. So that's, you know, that's unfortunate. Yeah, I can kind of see it. And then probably it was a little tough to get back to it with, with all of that happening and, 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 yeah. and whatnot that did, did uh, you know in the times that you were away from the hobby and then and obviously after your grandfather's passing uh did, did the railroad itself you know the prototype that did, did you have any real interest in that and did that really appeal to you or it it did um but again i didn't really have anybody that was into it and it's you know another unfortunate fact was i grew up like on such a popular spot in new jersey for rail fanning in bound brook new jersey's like oh yeah i don't know uh 10 minutes from where i grew up i could probably i rode my bicycle there as a kid you know through the train station i, I just never knew that watching trains was a thing and i wish I, you know i look back and i'm like man i could have if i would have known that people were doing that i would have been at the tr you know track side every day sure um you know and then you know as i grew up it was kind of like you know you have that feeling like wow i really like this stuff but you know, all my friends and everyone's into other things. And, you know, I got into cars and motorcycles and stuff like that. And, you know, but it was never gone. I think if I had the space, you know, at my parents' house and had a friend that was into it, I definitely would have just followed through all the way through that gap. Yeah, it definitely helps to have the people around you kind of supporting it and helping fuel yeah. that, that passion. But you found the a relight of this in a different way with YouTube. Do you remember what it was that you you had seen on YouTube that really started to spark this whole thing? I I can remember it you know very well. It was you know I was I moved down to Florida for school, and 
I remember being on YouTube for whatever reason, just browsing around and, you know, I don't know why, but the algorithm, you know, even back then somehow put a model railroad channel and I, and I can't remember what channel it was, but it was someone modeling Norfolk Southern, you know, it was a basement layout. Um, it wasn't scenic or anything, but he had lots of track and lots of locomotives. And I remember saying, wow, like, oh yeah, like look at this stuff. Look how far it's come, you know, since the models I had as a kid and it just immediately hooks me back in. I remember calling my mom like, like that day and being like, mom, remember I was, you know, so into the trains. Like I found that, you know, the hobby is still there. Like, you know, I don't know where it went, but you know, and that, that's all it took. And then from then on, I was just planning stuff. And as a, you know, while I was going through school down here, you know, I just was renting a house with a couple of friends and, you know, I couldn't even think of about starting a layout there, but once I had some space in the garage, I started, you know, dabbling a little bit in end scale actually, because the hobby shop here in Florida, where I was, the guy specialized in end scale. So, you know, I built a little layout just to, I don't know, it was a little L shaped. Uh, I can't remember how big it was, maybe six by six, you know, in an L six right. feet by six feet. Um, you know, and then, you know, I did a little, little bit, collected some things, um, my, my career took me elsewhere. I had to move. Um, and then, uh, so I sold off a lot of that stuff, but, um, circling back, bringing, coming back to Florida after my internship, um, I got back into, and that was the layout that I built previously, the small shelf layout in my, my old apartment. Yeah. It's it, you going back to you mentioning that you go to a local hobby shop and, you know, N is his influence. It's just amazing, you know, uh, how much the local hobby shop can really influence you, not only in scale, yeah. but product. And, you know, they, they can kind of be the, you know, the, not kind of, they are the leader in a lot of ways into what you get into in the hobby. Um, what were you modeling in N scale? Do you, what were you- nothing, nothing specifically. I was kind of, uh, I'm a collector at heart. Like I like to, whether it's now trains or other things, I like, I don't know what it is, but I like to, I like the, the, the search, you know, to hunt for stuff that you like, you want to find. And so I was collecting random things, you know, and N scale, some of the stuff I had a lot of, which I wish I kept because I know like, you know, those red caboose is that, I forget, was that the brand with those, they made those auto racks, which eventually someone else bought, but they go for crazy money on eBay. And I had like 20 of them, 30 of them, you know, I got a great deal on them and I got rid of them for nothing. Um, but yeah, I just dabbled a little bit, a little bit of FEC actually, because, you know, I live right near the FEC main line. So I thought that was pretty cool. But um, yeah, a little bit of everything. Did you have any favorite railroad or was there any you know one that really appealed to you other than you said the FEC was close, Florida East Coast, for those that don't know. Um, was there any one that really appealed to you? Yeah, um, you know, as a kid, you know, New Jersey was Conrail, you know, in the nineties. So I grew up, you know, seeing blue, blue locomotives. And I remember thinking as a young kid, you know, wow, you know, these trains are blue. That's, that's it. I didn't think of anything else other than blue trains and Conrail. Um, And actually when I moved to Florida, you know, it was still far into the uh, acquisition of Conrail and, or the split of Conrail. And, but there was still a lot of patched, units around where you would still see the blue, you know, Conrail locomotives, but you know, then you'd see some black Norfolk Southern locomotives. And I remember coming up, you know, after I started getting into the hobby again, I came up to visit my parents and I remember going through Bound Brook once I found out that was a good spot and being like, wow, all the trains are black now and they're all Norfolk Southern. So it was pretty cool to, you know, kind of look back and remember the blue locomotives and now they're all black. It was a, it was a, um, classic era that you was happening right around you and it, you, you uh, kind of, kind I of no went right, right around you i guess <laughs> i know i know literally so you're in florida then you, you got it you said you moved away from florida um mm-hmm. for a bit uh where where did where was your next uh next landing spot we uh we were up in delaware wilmington area okay. for i was up there for about a year and a half yeah just about a year and a half uh i was doing an internship up there um Another, it was right near, you know, Wilmington, right near uh, the Northeast Corridor, and I believe CSX and Norfolk Southern passed through there. Uh, but I was so busy, 
you know, I would work 60, 80 hours a week. It was just ridiculous. I didn't have time to even think about, you know, doing trains. I know I would visit a couple of hobby shops and just dream, you know, even financially back then it was, you know, it was tough times and saving all my money for other things. And, um, you know, once we finished up there and, and, and I got a, a good job and moved back to Florida, you know, that's when things kind of opened up, I had a lot of time, I had extra money. So naturally <laughs> I started building. So, so you get back to Florida, what was your, what was your first project there? Well, once I realized that, okay, I've got some space, you know, I'm going to try to try to build something. And at that point I had really no clue what I really wanted to model because my brain was so scattered. You know, when you, when you come into the hobby, I think it's kind of, it's really easy to get overwhelmed with what you can do, especially now with everybody, you know, making their stuff public on online. It's great because you just have so much, in, you know, inspiration that, you know, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was all over the place. I probably designed 50 track plans for a, you know, 18 inch deep by eight foot long layout. Um, I didn't know what, what prototype or anything. So that's when I remembered back when I was in Wilmington, uh, going to visit my parents all the time in New Jersey, we would pass by a refinery off of 95 in, in Philly, where it was, um, was some rail serve locomotives. And I remember seeing these bright yellow switchers and like, wow, those are cool. And I like, you know, the color yellow and they're grungy. It looks pretty cool. And, I remember passing by all the time, but you know, you're on 95, can't just stop. So I'd always kind of, every time I went by, I try to catch a little bit more of a peek of, you know, what they were. And I finally saw the reporting marks and I did some research. And so I was like, you know what? I don't know what I want to model. I'm just going to model a, a switching railroad because they get cars from all, all different kinds of people. And it would be fun to try to, um, uh, kit bash a locomotive, which is something I've never done. Right. So that's when I started planning, you know, okay, I'm going to buy this locomotive. And I found all these detail parts and came up with a little track plan. It was nothing prototypical, just a made up, made up industries and just went from there. You talk about, you know, the, the idea that, you know, in the beginning you were um, lone wolf and really didn't mm -hmm. have anybody to kind of support it and whatnot. And you, you start getting into this, where are you picking up this stuff? You know, like kit bashing and, and whatnot. Is this all from YouTube or are you, are you starting to pick up some influencers at that point? And yeah. Yeah. Some, some YouTube stuff. Um, model river hobbyist, uh, the forum group online. I think that's yep. what it is, right? MRH. Um, mm -hmm. that's actually where I started posting some of my stuff just for fun. I'm like, you know what, you know, people post have all kinds of threads on here and stuff to build. So I'm just going to try it, you know, whatever. So I posted some stuff and, you know, people gave good feedback and, Hey, you're doing great. And try this, try that. And eventually people were like, Hey, we really love to see your, what you're doing. You know, could you, you know, maybe do a video or something? Mm -hmm. And that's when I was like, well, I do have a YouTube channel, but I never even thought about, you know, posting videos on it. So it's, you know, that's like John two, six, one, eight was just, you know, it's actually, you know, obviously my name, but my firefighter idea I was a volunteer firefighter. So that was my ID. And I just started putting uh, videos on there, not thinking about, you know, it was ever going to, you know, build much traction or I was ever going to do more than maybe just post a couple videos. Um, so that's where it kind of all started. Seems to be a connection between firefighting and trains, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I think it's especially, again, with collecting. And I've got a lot of those Code 3 models, right. yeah. you know, that some of them are worth some money now. But, uh, yeah. but yeah, it's... There was a lot, actually, there was a guy in my, in my, uh, in my fire department who was a model railroader. And unfortunately I never, I never got to see his layout, but he always talked about it. And again, I wasn't really into it at the time. I was always like, Oh cool. You're, you got a layout. I, I need to come see it one day. And I just, I just never did. Yeah. Well, there was a, there was a firefighter in the neighboring town. I was a volunteer in a small town of Scotland and our neighboring town had a, a guy in the fire department that was a model railroader and ran to a, into him multiple times on scene. I knew who he was and never really tied the dots. And that was Mark Eric. And you know, oh, finally yeah. years later, it's like, 
Yeah. That's it's funny. like, so yeah. And then, you know, Don, I believe was a volunteer firefighter, Don Iris. And there's mm-hmm. so many others. I went, I joined the model railroad club. One of the guys was a former chief. It, it's just amazing that, yeah, there's some odd tie. That's a whole other podcast though. The tie between yeah. firefighting and model railroading, but definitely need to. Hear yeah. That. Yeah, absolutely. And, and another point that you kind of hit on too is, you know, this connection that you're using YouTube and all these, you know, modern channels, model railroad hobbyist, more of a digital magazine. And I was talking to, uh, or I saw a post the other day, uh, railroad model craftsman just had a young uh, man put an article in about kit bashing a warehouse and, uh, somebody put up there, you know, look, the, the, the hobby is still for the youth. And, you know, if anybody thinks that the youth isn't involved in model railroading, they're wrong and a hundred percent right. But they're not in the traditional places that you used to find them. They're not in, yeah. you know, necessarily in the magazines. And I credit, you know, in, 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 even in the post that I put back Otto Vondrak and the, and the staff at railroad model craftsman for getting this gentleman to write an article because the, the younger group, and you've done the same thing, you have direct access now. I mean, we're doing podcasts yep. now where it's direct access. You don't need anybody's real permission or a channel to go through. You can just directly connect with people. And the same thing's happening with YouTube videos, and you're doing it with your channel. And, and this gentleman's been doing it as well. It's just good to see him in writing and going back to some traditional places as well. What got you into doing it? You, you start putting the YouTube videos up. What was really the drive for that? Sharing what I was doing and at the same time kind of giving back a little bit, you know, since, you know, I, I've followed so many people and, you know, hundreds of channels just gathered information from, um, I thought it was definitely important to kind of give back and kind of show what I'm doing as well. Right. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, I, I started watching some of the videos as we were doing some pre-show research. And one thing I can tell that you've done is that you're really talented in is the car weathering. And I want you to talk a little bit about oh, yeah. that. When, when, you know, when did weathering kind of get on your radar and, you know, some of the techniques you've, you've kind of picked up from, from doing the weathering. I've always been fascinated with weathering. I remember when I was a young, you know, even young kid, I always looked at the cars and thought it'd be pretty cool to, you know, um, mimic these weathered and dirty cars and never really thought about, um, the process involved with it until again, YouTube and some of the online forums to see how people are doing it. And I just, just started doing it. Um, Mike Confalone, his, you know, his Allagash railroad is is one of the biggest influences on, on me. And uh, he had a couple cool videos of um, weathering and I followed them and that's what really kind of got me going. It's just the basics, you know, how to use the oil paints and using dull coat and powders and so on. So, uh, yeah, that was, that's pretty much what sparked it right there. It's, it's a pretty amazing era that we live in, isn't it? That going from where, you know, you started where you have to go to a hobby shop and they're really the influence. And now the information's just right there at our fingertips. So, so easy to get a hold of. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's, you can learn anything from online on, you know, it's kind of crazy. Yeah. Anywhere, anything from car weathering to, you know, today me looking up how to fix my washer. You know, every everything That's is true. there. You know, it's 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 quite amazing. Yeah, yeah. So you're doing the YouTube videos now, and make sure I have this straight. You're you're in your former residence, still doing this, right? You're doing some, yeah, you know, a little bit of feedback, MRH, and all that. That was still happening at your former residence in Florida. Yeah. So I was in the apartment for, gosh, I was almost five years. Um, and that was right when I when I moved back. I started. And I just moved into a new house and started a new layout. But, um, but yeah, I was doing all that out of my apartment spare bedroom. <laughs> just little little spray booth, little workbench, and the little layout. Nice. So what did you have, just a little switching layout? Is that what you were working at? Or? Yep, just a small. It was, uh, it was about eight feet long with a little bit of an L extension. Um, you know, just enough to, you know, I never thought much of it. Um, actually until a, a funny story was, uh, you know, Thomas Kowalski reached out to me and I'm thinking, what, why, why is he, you know, <laughs> yeah. I'm like, he's like, Hey, you know, your layout's fascinating. And, you know, I'd love to come take some pictures. I'm going to be down in Florida. Huh. Um, and we worked out a, a date and he came over and I remember, you know, telling my wife, I'm like, 
this is crazy. Like I just threw this thing on the wall and now all of a sudden someone's wants to come take pictures of it. And you know, that's how him and I met and we've become really close friends. Um, but, but yeah, it was like such a mind blowing experience and it was pretty cool. It was, he, uh, featured me in his book that he just came out with. So that was, that was pretty cool. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. Uh, and, and all meeting him through online, right? I mean, just, just through, through YouTube. Yeah. Amazing. It's amazing the networking that's being done nowadays and, you know, meeting new people and whatnot. And, um, I, I guess speaking of new people, so you, you move into a different neighborhood and I think you picked the right neighborhood. So uh, yeah. <laughs> we'll get to that. Um, so you start building a house. Let's, let's get to that point. So now you're going to, now you've, you've decided you're going to build a house right out of yeah. out of the apartment, which is, yeah. which is an undertaking in itself. I can only imagine. I've never built yeah. one. I can only imagine. Yeah. And it was right at the right slash wrong time, I guess you could say with the economy and how everything kind of went crazy with the housing market. But I got really lucky and signed on the house before the big spike and I got locked in my price, which to this date, I swear that they, they tried to get me out of that house so many times so they could sell it to somebody else and sure. make twice the twice as much money. But, but yeah, it was, it was a long delay, you know, delay after delay, almost a year and a half of delays, but it was worth it to hang on to it. Yeah. So you went right in at what it was uh pandemic, supply chain mm-hmm. issues, lumber prices going through the roof, just a whole bunch yeah. of different. Yeah. 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 You, you nailed all of them right all in the, in, in the Oh yeah. Swipe there. So, but what, as you're planning this house, uh, model rail running has got to be on your mind. Oh, absolutely. Um, I kind of got lucky, you know, we, we decided to go a little bit bigger. I don't have any kids. So mm-hmm. it was me and my wife and we we're like, well, you know, might as well, build a little bigger and you know grow into it so i have two extra bedrooms in the back of the house that are kind of secluded so immediately in my head i'm thinking those are going to be my train rooms right right <laughs> you know i'm calling those and, and the deal was there's a nice big great room in the front that's kind of secluded from the dining room living room area and it would be a perfect room for a layout i mean it's big it's it's really nice but i was like you know what she could have that room for her stuff and I'm taking these two rooms because I already in my head, I'm thinking work area, you know, nice little workshop. And then I could have my nice little switching layout in the other room. You, you figured it out. It takes good negotiation to, to, to get right. good deals like that. And yeah, you know, a little, little compromise gets you a long way. So, so you've, uh, you've now got these two rooms, you got this thing built. I know you had, you, you know, with all the, the challenges and everything else, you've got the house built. So, uh, Talk me through what you what you're starting to put together in your head for a track plan. What's you, what you, what's your initial plan for for the layout you're putting down? Um, initially, uh, I went again through almost every option I could think of. Um, you know, from uh, I don't know, maybe five different prototypes. Uh, just. I didn't really know what I wanted with an empty canvas so or a blank canvas. So uh, I went from, you know, around the rooms, you know, through the rooms, taking out this wall between the two rooms and making one big room. You know, I thought of it all. And it always came back to the simple little switching layout. That's what it always came back to. Just with the space I have, I just don't have the room for mainline running, which is something I would like to do. But you know, I didn't want to have a train chasing itself through towns and, you know, so on. So I was like, you know, what? I'm just going to go with one big industrial area again, but this time spread things out more prototypically. So there's space between the industries and, you know, maybe have enough room for two operators at the same time. Um, so that's what I decided to go with. So you're uh, so you're starting to go through these plans and, and you know you're, you're starting to put something together. When do you meet the neighbors? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So so my neighbor Don Iris. So literally a street over from me. Um, you know, I remember hearing about Don and thinking he lives in Sebastian. It, this town is very small. There's no way you know I, I'm going to find him eventually. Um, so I eventually got his contact information and reached out to him. And I remember him saying, we were like, Oh, I was like, Oh, I'm building a house in Sebastian. I live down 
you know, in Vero, the town south of us. And he's like, well, where's your house going to be? I'm okay, right here. And he's like, well, I'm over there. What, you know, this and that. And then turns out we're like, like I said, a street over from each other. So that's, it's pretty wild. And you know, what, what a, can't ask for a better neighbor as, in terms of inspiration, skill, and being able to, to operate with somebody. It's like perfect. We'll pick on him for a few minutes here. Uh, but how did you hear about, I mean, what was the first, you know, that you had heard of, of Don? I heard of him on uh, the AML podcast. Okay. And I heard of him over there. And again, he talked about living in, in Sebastian. And I mean, like I said, small town, there's gotta be a way we can meet up. Yep. So you, so you reached out directly to Don and, and, and got to meet him. Yeah. I think I was, I think I was talking with, uh, Scott Thornton, actually. Okay. And I remember he, we were talking about, I forget, we were talking about, I think the layout that I'm building now, you know, I went, went through Scott, went through Tom, a lot of different, you know, modelers talked to about the track plans and so on. And I remember telling him like, Hey, I'm pretty sure there's going to be a, I'm going to have a cool new neighbor. And turns out, I think Don just purchased some, uh, those derails from, from Scott. And he's like, Hey, I'll, I'll give him your, uh, or, or he's got a YouTube channel. That was it. He does have a YouTube channel. Yep. So I found him on YouTube okay. and I messaged him on there and that's how we kind of started talking. It's really amazing that, you know, the, you know, the, the hobby and, you know, they talk about seven degrees of separation. I don't even think there's seven degrees to it. I think sometimes it's just like three. Yeah. You start talking yeah, to no somebody kidding. who knows somebody who, you know, it, it's just uh, pretty amazing how, how big the hobby is yet how well networked it is. And just increasing yes. more and more is, you know, the, the social media and YouTube and all that other stuff is, is, is pulling oh, people together. Absolutely. And especially with my job, I travel a lot and, you know, with being online, talking to people, I'll go to, you know, different places. And, you know, I've met so many people, different common places I go to where I could meet up with people and do train stuff, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. It's it's a neat hobby because it travels well. I mean, I've, I've gone you know multiple places where the same thing. You you land in town, you find a local hobby shop, and you know then yes. you just start talking to people. And next thing you know, you may be at a club or oh, you got to go see this guy's house. He's having an open house this weekend, or I know I can get you in somewhere. And you know it's really cool how how quickly you can get yourself in in a new area. But, oh yeah. Uh, but definitely great for you to con- you know to connect with Don Iris. Don is uh, you know legendary up in these parts, and uh, our loss is your gain for sure. So <laughs> so so you meet him online, you send him a message, and eventually you I'm sure you go over and you 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 see the shed right. Oh, uh, it was pretty quick too. He's like you know I think almost right away he's like hey you got to come over one day and it's like well tomorrow I'm home and he's yeah. like well come on over so went over and met him and um walk into the shed and it's just like everybody describes you walk in the backyard to see a shed you're like okay this can be cool and you walk in and you're like wow i mean it's 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 impressive what what you could put in that space and the amount of operation that's there i mean we we operated last week we operated for four hours and we didn't even finish everything we were you know busy which is which is fun you know it feels like a real railroad yeah, a, a, a railroad and a twelve by twenty four shed. That's right, double decked, and yeah, and, and just amazing how much you can fit in operations. Um, what were, were some of the takeaways that you had from that, from your first experience, and in, in, in kind of what you were trying to plan and do with your layout? How did that? What kind of influence was that on it? So immediately, I thought I've got to make my layout so I could have more than one person operate, and that was something new to me because you know with my first layout it was just me and that's all i ever thought there would be i would never thought of you know a second person operating with me so i quickly tried to make it accommodating for two or you know accommodating for two people um and uh yeah so that was the big thing and you know i wish i could have gone double deck and so on but it's just it just wouldn't fit here. If I had a bigger room for a helix, I probably would be crazy enough to do it. But yeah, I, I had to restrain myself and kind of stick to the simple track plan. 
Yeah, but it, you know, it, in turn, I've got a small layout myself, and you know, we we've, we've talked to a lot of people with, you know, bigger uh, layouts, smaller layouts, and you know, it, it's just amazing what you can do if you if you plan it well. And you know, for Don, you know, he he had a bit very large layout, and now he's gone to this twelve by twenty four layout, but yet he's still got it action packed with with operations, mm-hmm. and it's just all in the planning. Yeah, absolutely. And a big, a big thing with the small layouts too, is I feel you you could actually spend time and like hyper focus on scenes and small little details that you couldn't even think about doing on a massive layout. I mean, you could, but you know, obviously it's going to take a lot of time. Um, But, uh, but yeah, I I noticed that now that Don's got everything kind of running, you know, now with his newly work his got signals now and it's you know we were just doing the remote dispatch with with mark right which is a first for me i've never operated a model railroad with a dispatch or anything like that so that's just a whole new dynamic that you know it's just so cool you just get so immersed in especially his layout operating you really do feel like you're working it in real life yeah definitely and it's a great influence and he's uh such a huge help in, in, uh, not only the, the planning of, of a layout, but also, um, you know, uh, basically, I mean, he's, he's, you know, tech support when it really comes down to a lot of stuff, he uses the wealth of knowledge and willing to help. I mean, you, you, you know, he may, uh, he may, uh, rib you a little bit as you go, but that's, that's, uh, to be expected and, and is all, all part of the fun as well. So, um, him and I had a lot of great conversations. We chat uh, quite often and, you know, he was obviously mentioning to all of us the the layout that you were putting in. He was really excited to have somebody close to him, uh, you know, that he felt was a, you know, a a good level, a top level model, or as he, as he calls you um, putting a layout together. So he'll have a, be able to put a good network together as he already has down there in Florida. Uh, Yeah. So, so now we're back to you over to your place. So you, you've got this idea. Now you got to start putting uh, bench work together and you and whatnot. Mm-hmm. So you got you kind of got a plan in your head. Talk about you know, the next steps. Yeah. So the biggest challenge would be to go through the two rooms. So I painstakingly had to cut holes in three walls of brand new fresh drywall. You know, I think um, you may have avoided the warranty <laughs> on that new house. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. Um, but yeah, it's just, you know, I wanted one room for the layout. Um, I didn't want any duck unders or lift outs, which was tough because I really wish I could have gone bigger around one more wall. But at the same time, I wanted to have access to one of the closets still. And with working in um, two rooms at the same time, I wanted to avoid any, you know, duck unders or lift outs to go back and forth between the rooms. I wanted it to be pretty easy, which... I think we've accomplished, uh, you know, it's, it's easy to walk back and forth between the rooms and, um, I kind of wanted it to be all off the floor. So I went with the, you know, the shelf style. Um, so there's no, no legs of the layout. It's, it's all off the floor. It's pretty clean. I like the look of, uh, you know, if, if one of the selling points, I guess, for the layout in the house is, you know, if it looks good, you know, almost like furniture. It's a little bit easier to, to have in my opinion. So, you know, it looks good. I bring people over and they come in the room and they're immediately just like, wow, you know, everything's, you know, it looks like furniture. And that's, that's kind of what I was after. I just wanted it to look clean. Um, and you know, switching. So like I said earlier, I didn't have the room for mainline running. So I thought, you know what, let's just do some realistic, switching operations again i have i have the proto throttle so don has the proto throttle so that, that's kind of fun to have two people operating on the layout which slows things down which makes again makes the layout feel much bigger now let's talk about the scheme a little bit because i kind of glossed over that a little bit because i think that's very important we thought mentioned it in the beginning uh the somerset industrial uh yeah and and you know where where it's set and everything else why don't you why don't you fill us in on that backstory Sure. So Somerset Industrial is just a freelance area. Um, I grew up in Somerset, New Jersey. So the, uh, the layout kind of just, you know, I, I picked some industries um, from different railroads in the area and kind of spliced them together on my railroad. 
Uh, and I still have rail serve switching it. So in theory, in my head, I'm like, okay, rail serve has the contract for this industrial area that maybe was served once before by Conrail or Norfolk Southern or something. And maybe the business wasn't the best. So, you know, rail serve came in and now took over the contract and is, you know, switching and interchanges with Norfolk Southern. Um, I, I, I really would like to come up with a freelance railroad. That's kind of my, my goal over the next year is to come up with a neat, um, a neat little railroad that just, you know, I I kind of enjoy the whole storytelling of it. You know, I think that's one thing that's interesting about the hobby with uh, prototype modelers is you're kind of following a script and you're following history. You know, you're rewriting history basically on your railroad, which is, which is great. I mean, if I, if if I could find something, I'm just so scattered brained with everything. If I could find something and dial in, I would love to follow a prototype, but, Right now, I kind of just have gotten the feeling of trying to write my own story right. of a railroad. I think that's pretty cool with with some really interesting, again, Mike Confalone's Allagash. I mean, when I first saw that, I thought that was a real railroad. I had no idea that was a freelance railroad. Same here. I'm, oh, you know, when yeah. I hear these, you know, you start Googling, it's like, okay, where where was this really? And, you know, you find out and there's some really great storytellers in, in the freelance world. And, you know, I interviewed one of them in Chris Palmieri. And, mm-hmm. you know, he's just got one of these amazing, you know, stories that he's developed over the years. And uh, I, I, when I heard that, I was like, you know, I guess at first, but going into it, I was like, wow, freelance railroading seems pretty easy because you can just kind of invent what you want. And I'm realizing it, that's probably not the case, because like you said, yeah, with a with a if you're modeling uh, a prototype railroad, they've kind of told you how the story goes and then maybe you make a little twist here and there and then you come up with that you know that new term called proto freelance and you kind of got a mix of the two but when you develop your own freelance railroad you you've got to not only create a story but one that's convincing enough for you to believe and then if you're going out and you know talking about your layout a story that's can that can uh, convince others that yeah yeah this makes sense this is kind of the real deal yeah, yeah, I really admire those who who've created those freelance railroads because that's definitely not easy. Um, it's a lot, a lot of thought, and um, I don't know. I, I just I'm really inspired by that recently, and thinking maybe I'll give it a try, and you know, come up with the Somerset Industrial, maybe Somerset Industrial, um, you know, industrial railroad or something like that. I don't know. Right. Let's let's talk about what kind of status you are now, and we'll we'll share some pictures of your progress and definitely the YouTube videos because you can go to those uh, and and check out uh, John's progress. He's done a great job of sharing what he's got going on and some of those projects. Um, what, what what at what status do you say the layout is at right now? So we're at the operate. We, we could operate it. Um, all the track works down minus one industry. Um, and, uh, you know, everything's wired. Um, we've got a little small little signal system going to, you know, keep people safe from hitting each other in between the two rooms. Um, uh, that's operating pretty cool or, or pretty well. Um, I've got the photo backdrops up. Um, that was one thing I wanted to do before I did any scenery. It's just so much easier without obstructions to get it against, you know, a good, you know, uh, photo backdrop up. So I did that and now I'm kind of in the planning phase of the, of the, um, structures. So, um, I, I, I like to scratch build the stuff, you know, as much as I can. So I kind of just have things mocked up and, um, uh, I'll soon be kind of building, building, or starting to scratch build the structures. How, how often do you get to operate the layout? Have you been able to, um, you said you can have up to two operators. Have you been able to do the two operator, uh, set up on that layout? Yeah, actually, maybe it was last weekend, a weekend before I had, uh, Don and Tom, Thomas Klamowski come over and we did a little kind of a shakedown op session, which is really cool. Um, I just kind of sat back, made up a couple switch lists for them and said, okay, you guys go ahead. And they just kind of, you know, did a little switching and I kind of made things a little difficult on purpose just to see if there was any, 
you know, pinch points and the track work or things where, you know, if you have two crews running, um, uh, but the way it's designed with kind of a long runaround, um, uh, people can operate two industries and use the two sides of the runaround as leads and not really interfere with each other. And the same thing with the second or the extra room that I've got for kind of a small yard, someone can work the yard and use the about seven, eight feet between the two rooms through the closets as a lead, as well as the other crews using that as a lead for the industries, which is why we put the signals up a little simple ABS block detection. And, right. and it works. It was pretty yeah. cool to see, uh, you know, everything worked well. The track work was good. Um, the two locomotives, which are using now, I've got the two rail serve, uh, one's a SW 1200, the other one, a GP seven, uh, they got keep lives in them. And so no issues really with the locomotives. Um, it was, it was cool. It was, it was, I would say it was a success for the first little op session. You got Tom Kilmoski and Don Ira shaking down your layout. Is yeah, that, is that, cool. is that <laughs> awesome opportunity or a lot of pressure? <laughs> Uh, both and a little bit of luck, I think too. <laughs> yeah, for sure. It, it was, it was, it was great. I really look forward to, you know, having Tom come down again and some others, you know, we could do a little, it's pretty cool with us living so close, uh, Don and I, where we could do a little bit of a operate at Don's for a few hours, you know, go get some lunch, yep. come over to mine, maybe do an hour, hour and a half little op session over here. It's cool. It's, it's something that I feel like I was really missing in the hobby you know being the lone modeler for the longest time yep. um but now it's it's just brought a whole new kind of interest to the hobby for me it's a, a new excitement you know oh it's fun to share absolutely yeah, absolutely share. yeah you know I'm, I'm sure we've got you know the lone wolves that that may listen to the show and you know in, in all due respect to that I've, I've mentioned this in multiple shows that you know hey you know you get it, it's your hobby and you know you the, it's for you and it's it's no matter what size layout you build or how many people you know you got to build a layout for you um, absolutely but boy is it fun to share it too to get somebody over there and you know, it's fun to you know the, the things that you you concentrate on on your layout and then somebody comes over and they notice something totally different and just that feeling that note that you know they're they're the things that they noticed weren't the things I thought to notice but it's still neat that they're seeing things on my layout and pointing them out and enjoying it absolutely yeah it's it's just you know a lot of uh a lot of fun and it's a good way to meet people and make new friends for sure so as you build this layout you know between two rooms but still in a you know a, a, a considered in that smaller shelf layout uh, you know the, the conclusion of of getting knowing yourself right and what you're able to handle and, and what you're able to model because you're a pretty busy guy i'll mention you know you, you mentioned the earlier part of the show that you're a pilot and you, you yes. spend a lot of time, you know, you got some downtime, but then you're, then you're off and you're in a lot of different places and, <laughs> you know, all over the place. So I'm sure that was a, you know, part of the consideration of, of what you were going to build. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I could be gone a day. I could be gone two weeks. It just depends. Could be in Africa. It could be in South Carolina, just it, it, yeah. all over the world. Um, so, you know, having the layout and, um, doing a little bit of, of work when I can, if I'm home for a couple of days, I try to get some stuff done, but you know, if I'm gone, uh, that's when I do a lot of my planning. Right. All right. I'm sure. Yeah. Sitting, uh, you know, whatever in between, uh, in between flights, uh, thinking that stuff out. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's when I usually do the most damage of, you know, on the wallet as I come up with all these plans and I start ordering stuff. And by the time I get home, I got all these boxes waiting for me. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I know the feeling. Or <clears throat> if you're out traveling and you see these other hobby shops and not ain't much else to do, unless you're you know find some rail fanning to do, yeah, it, it can definitely be brutal on the wallet. Yeah, for sure. Another thing that you talk about in the uh, YouTube channel um, that that really was fascinating to me was uh, relationship with your father-in-law as you're helping him. So you're building a layout with your father-in-law. Mm-hmm was he a model railroader prior to meeting you or did you kind of, did you infect him with the, with the bug? Uh, he wasn't active in the hobby, but he always talked about as a kid, kind of like the same, you know, having the stuff with his dad and, um, 
having trains and and he would come over and see my stuff and just be like wow like this is just crazy from you know when he was a get out months it's changed and you know he had a little extra space in his uh kind of outdoor room that was converted to kind of like an extra den and he's like let's build a layout so it just started building him a layout and he's doing a little by little and he's having fun with it which is just most important i told him one thing i said listen I'm going to do the track work with you. Let's do the track work right. Because if it doesn't run right, you're not going to have fun. For so sure. Yeah, for sure. We, we we really hit hard with making sure the track work was flawless. And after that, I said, do whatever you want. You know, so he's been doing that and he's doing great. And he's just loving it. You know, doing scenery and building structures, Walther's kits and stuff. Um, it, it's it's great. I mean, like for someone to get back into the hobby, um you know, it's bringing him a lot of joy, which is which is really great. Was he? Um, you, you mentioned he was a kind of a dormant model railroader. Is he a rail fan as well? That he was he into the kind of that, or was it just no? Just really kind not of so just much. The model railroad stuff, huh? Yeah, just I think mostly when he was a kid, it was more the um, the three rail stuff, okay, yep. a little bit of HO. But interesting part where he lives, his backyard is like right against the FEC main line, which is which is really cool because when we go over to his house. You could just look in the backyard and you could hear the trains coming and you could do a little rail fanning from, from his backyard. Right. Which is cool. Yeah. So he's, yeah. he's immersed in it. Yeah. So yeah. Now, now he's, now he catches himself looking at the cars that go by and he's like, Oh, I could get that one. Oh, I have that car. I could do this. So it's, it's kind of cool to see. That's kind of how it starts and, you know, really start to roll into it a little bit deeper is to, you know, be able to relate to what you're seeing. So that definitely helps. What, what is he, uh, what's he modeling? Is it a, a class one railroad or is it a, what, what's he, what's he got for, uh, for, uh, locomotives and rolling stock? Um, just a little bit of everything, nothing in, nothing in particular at all. He's kind of just, I got him a couple locomotives, um, Norfolk Southern. I got, he grew up in the Ohio area. So I got him a, a Chessy, uh, locomotive and, just some B and O cars, a bunch of coal cars. We got a good deal on, and we made a little coal, a little uh, uh, coal mine for him, and nice. just a little bit. You know, he doesn't. Uh, he's uh, retired, and you know, doesn't have a lot of extra money. So I kind of help him out with some some good budget friendly stuff. But he's having a he's having a lot of fun with it. That's great, and that's uh, that's really neat. You know, sometimes uh, you know it's hard to connect with your father in law you try to find some common ground with them, but when, you know, the common ground could be in model railroading, boy, you, you, you hit the jackpot, you know, that's that yeah. you sort of certainly consider yourself lucky because it is really cool to be able to, you know, share that hobby and, you know, have, the, have that, uh, something to talk about this Thanksgiving when you're sitting at the table or, or whatever event it is, you, you've got something to really be relatable to them. Absolutely. Has he uh, come over and operated your layout yet? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, the proto throttles is pretty cool to, to give him and kind of show him the basics. And, you know, again, it slows things down. It, it, it does feel like a real locomotive. Um, so that's, that's kind of cool. He's having fun with that. I'm sure he'll be doing some of that, uh, in a few days here. And what's he using to operate his, uh, for, for an operating. I got him a good deal on the, uh, the digit tracks, the Zephyr, just the simple Zephyr, you know, the, um, little station okay yep. um so he's he's using that um we found a good deal on one so just to just to basically you know run trains from where he sits and and stuff like that we'll eventually make a kind of expand it i think you know mm-hmm. since with digitracks you could expand things a bit sure um but uh but yeah it's just very simple which is perfect for him that's great, and he was pretty open minded thinking about the proto throttle. Was it overwhelmed or anything with it? Just kind of, kind of t- took to it. No, yeah, he's a, a mechanical guy, okay. so he kind of figured it out pretty quickly. Yeah, that, that so, definitely would help. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. So you got you got that you you've got him started. How far does he how far does he live from you? Pretty pretty close where you can kind of get over there and help he, him. Yeah, he's also here in Sebastian. So oh, it's, look at that. Yeah, a couple miles away taking him over to don's yet no but i i would love to because yeah. ah, he's going to be blown away yeah. he, may, he may be making changes to his layout don, don's <laughs> yeah. influential like that you know yeah he, he he'll he'll get to you he'll turn you 
you know, he'll, yeah, that's uh, funny. But no, it's good. It's it's great. It's a great support system. And when you have your father in law in there, and everybody's together, and you know you get other people tying in, it's just really cool to have a a great group of guys uh, that can that can help and you know keep each other motivated, and inspire each other. That's that's definitely something really great to happen. Absolutely. So what's next for uh, the? Uh, you, know, you talked about maybe building a scheme and doing. Uh, some uh you know building a, a freelance type uh, operation with it you've talked about some scratch building what else do you have on your on your list to do for the layout um i just put a nice nice order in for um a lot of senior materials so i'm gonna start um planning that out um I, I decided to start over at the transload area, which it's kind of a cool industry. I, in my opinion, with uh, all the covered hoppers, they're like my favorite, favorite cars, uh, especially to weather. And um, these uh, dry bulk trailers, which I'm kind of setting myself up for torture by stripping a lot of them and repainting them, decaling them. And um, I like doing those little types of projects. So I'm going to start that. Um and then I think I'm going to start at that side of the layout and kind of work my way towards the yard and just kind of slowly work that way. Just do things slow and um, really take my time. I don't want to rush it. I find the build process is really what kind of drives me. Like once I got to a certain point on the old layout, it was kind of like, uh, I could do a little bit here and there, but you know, I also knew it wasn't a f- permanent layout. So um but I, I do really enjoy the the planning and um, the design. So each industry, I've got you know a baseline or a base design. But now it's coming into the, you know the structures, the layout of of, of you know the scenery around the, the industries and and so on. So um, that's what I'm looking forward to now. And 3D printing. I just bought myself a little resin printer, and I'm gonna you know I've got a bunch of stuff already designed, and I'm looking forward to start printing some stuff. What kind of stuff are you going to be doing with a 3D printer? Is this your first sh- Let me ask first. Is this your first shot at a 3D printer? Is this something new to you, or have you done kind of this thing before? I, I've, I've, it's my first printer, but I've designed a lot of stuff and sent them to Shapeways. Okay, so um, you're no rookie so to this. Some, yeah. No, I've, I've got a bunch of uh, truck bodies that I've designed and sent off to be printed which are pretty expensive so i think like two or three bodies that i print will pay for the printer itself right um yeah and a few you know detail parts and i'm gonna try to try to use it to you know make windows and and stuff for the for the buildings um uh yeah we'll see but i didn't get anything crazy just a small cheaper resin printer yeah, it's another another wild development in our uh, hobby to be able to create your own oh, products yeah. and you know pieces, and you don't have to hope that somebody else makes it, and you know, and ma- ma- major manufacturer gets it on their radar and they start producing it. You you can take it right into your own hands. Yeah, yeah, and there's a few truck trailers that I'm gonna I'm kind of almost done with a couple. Uh, one of the commodities that the transload is going to be road salt, and I'm made a few uh like dump trailers for like a a semi truck um and uh, i'm gonna print a few of those and see how they turn out and so i'm looking forward to that yeah the uh yeah the the definitely neat i saw your uh you posted uh uh, some pictures and I think maybe some video or though I may be mistaken. Um, you had the food liner trailers that you were putting together, yes. the pneumatic trailers. And, uh, it's kind of funny. I, I, I commented that I did so much deletion of those trailers on Don's backdrop that he's got in Valley falls. And you, you're right down the street. And the guy's actually making the, the, the trailers that I was deleting <laughs> off of his backdrop. I know there there's one, I know there's one in that backdrop right. and he's got my, one of my pneumatic trailers from my old layout. I let him borrow them while I was, while I was moving. Yep. So that's sitting there in its place, but I, that, that food liner truck's going to Don. Oh, so I'm brilliant. sure that'll be, be right in, right in that little, uh, that yard where, right where you deleted all those ones out of the photo backdrop. <laughs> <laughs> where, where did, you know, they, they were just, uh, it was amazing. We're, we're shooting that, uh, that uh, Valley Falls backdrop and, I had I'd brought my drone over to Valley Falls and, you know, shot it, but I'm flying 
all around those trailers as I'm trying to shoot, you know, get the, the sections of that uh, backdrop. And then I'm putting it all together and I'm taking the trailers out and rebuilding doors where doors are supposed to be all in Photoshop to try to get that to, to, to work. And it's just funny. I spent a lot of time looking at those and then seeing the model of it. It's, it's, it's pretty funny. That um, is funny. Where did you get the decals for it? Is that something you custom ordered or was that something readily available? <laughs> I did um up through a a Bill Brillinger for the PDC. Um I think that's a precision design company. Okay. I believe that's it. Um he did a phenomenal job. I mean I reached out to him and uh told him what I wanted and gave him some reference photos and you know I have a lot of other a few other trailers that he's going to or that he designed for me. Um and uh some some decals for the rail serve locomotive finishing up and excellent yeah they came out really nice yeah look great and then uh the, the truck and trailers there uh where, where did you get where'd you acquire those i forget who makes them it's uh, is it either trucks and stuff or i, I forget the brand I think it but was trucks and stuff that made is it those. yeah what are they like it's a- about time they made those because it's I, I i 3d printed one years ago and it was you know almost a hundred dollars to print that trailer and it didn't come out as nearly as good as these. Yeah, the pneumatic trailers have got to be a little tough with a lot of a lot of angles to it, and you know the yeah. shape of that's got to be a pretty tricky to, to print. And then what's what's a track? Is it a Peterbilt or Kenworth tractor? Yeah, I'm, I know that Foodliner runs. I think they run internationals, but I told Don he's he's getting a Peterbilt, so he yeah. got a Peterbilt. I think they might run uh, Freightliner. So yeah. with Freightliner, okay, yeah, that's it might a, be a yeah, Freightliner. Yeah. So, but that's all right. You know, they, they upgraded. They went to a Peterbilt. So, that's right there you go so well john i appreciate you being on around the layout it was really cool to kind of catch up with you and, and learn about your layout and what you got going on there in your in your new home and uh you're you're in a really great group i i i admire it a little jealous because uh like i said you know us losing don up here is certainly your gain and it's great that you know you're part of that that really great network and you're you're gonna be uh you're gonna be uh uh, well taken care of for for quite a good yeah. amount of time with with a good group of friends down there so uh enjoy it it's 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 yeah, a lot of fun i sure am i sure am thank you for joining us for this episode of around the layout you'll find more about today's show on our facebook page facebook.com backslash around the layout learn more about the show and check out past and future episodes on our website around the layout.com and send us your feedback. We'd love to hear from you around the layout at gmail.com. Thanks again for hanging out with us around the layout.